Good morning, everybody. I'm glad that you're here. I'm Reed Robinette. I'm the senior pastor here at Crossroads. And you know, there are some mornings where when I walk up those stairs, I think, my gosh, we could just close in prayer right now because the Lord was in this place this morning. And I love, well, I love, that's my favorite hymn that we sang, um, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And I didn't know that last song. That was a new one for me, but I loved it. And then just getting to hear from Carrie um, all the great stuff that's going on, I just thought, gosh, we should just go to the Lord's table and be done with it. It, But we're not going to do that. Because I prepared this whole thing, you know, and so we should probably do that. And here's why. If you're just joining us, um, we are in the fourth or fifth, I've lost track, week of this message about wisdom. And so I just, I'll hear, I'll start the thing out with a question for everybody. Could anybody in the room, you, you don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to, could anybody in the room use some more wisdom? It, it, besides me, you're like, you're like, I don't care if you said don't raise your hand, I'm going to raise my hand. Yes, right? And, and if you're just joining us, it, it's, it's been something that I think has been particularly um, useful it, not just theoretical in our, in our lives. We, we've talked about how wisdom is not just gaining more information. we got plenty of information. What we need to learn, what I need to learn, and what I'm finding out a lot of us are interested in learning, is how to apply the wisdom, how to apply the information, rather, which is wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to make right choices. So if you're you know, following along here, Here's the suggestion. If you pay attention this morning, you may be able to avoid a really stupid decision that you're thinking about making right now. (laughs) That's coming up soon. You're going to make a really dumb choice like some of the ones that you've made in the past. But if you pay attention, the book of Proverbs claims that it will make us less stupid. And, and so that, for me, is worth listening to. And so that's why I'm not going to just close in prayer. We're going to learn some more about wisdom this morning. And so it, maybe some of you have been reading through the book of Proverbs. We sort of said, hey, look, why don't you, in the month of July, just read a proverb a day. And so maybe today you're on Proverbs 29 and, and, or 30. And, and uh, I don't even know what day it is. 30 is today. And if you've been reading along, you might have noticed that the Proverbs are written in a very specific way. They are often very short, one or two line sayings. They're, they're pithy, um, creative ways of giving deep insight into what life looks like. And it turns out that almost every culture has these things. You might have heard of uh, Chinese Proverbs and and. Almost every culture has some sort of form of crafting a little statement that sticks in your head that describes some truth about what you see in life. And I thought, you know, in our culture, country music is one of those places. If you look at the the titles of country music songs, it just is, it's almost like an American proverb. You don't believe me, do you? Watch, these things are stuck in your head. I'll, I'll, I'll prove it to you. This is going back a little ways now. You might have heard this country music song. God is great, beer is good, and people are? See? And there's a lot of truth in that statement. <laughs> I'm not going to go each one, you know, one by one there, but there's a lot of truth. And I'll go back even farther. I bet you've heard of this one too. Oh, Lord. See, it's, it's, it's religious, right? Oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. Yeah, see, it's stuck in your head, right? Um, these maybe aren't so religious, but uh, people online shared wisdom from country music. I got a kick out of some of these. She got the ring and I got the finger. <laughs> not sure what that's about. Um, <laughs> this is actually from a country music song. You're the reason our kids are so ugly. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not. You know, It's a perspective issue. I still miss you, baby, but my aim's getting better. And then I'll bring it back, a little religious here. Uh, You've probably heard this one. Drop kick me Jesus through the goalpost of life. (laughs) Yeah, and and all kidding aside, we've been looking at for four weeks, uh, what does it look like to be wise? What does a wise person look like? And this morning, what I want to do is I want to flip the script. I want to look at the other side of the coin. I want to look at what's the opposite 
of a wise person. Because just as often in the book of Pro, don't point to somebody next to you. That was, some of you were like, I see what somebody not wise looks like. In the book of Proverbs, we're uh, given pictures just as often of what not wise looks at looks like as we are what wise looks like. And the, the person who's not wise is caused, called what? Fool. Yeah, fool. And, and so this morning, I want to look at, take a deep dive into what does the book of Proverbs say about a fool. And so we'll learn from the opposite side of, of the coin. Let, let's start here. In Proverbs chapter 1, you don't have to go very far before you find this description of a fool. And in Proverbs 1 verse 22, this is what we read. How long will you, simp- you, you who are simple love your simple ways? How long will mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? Now, if you notice as we're going through there, there are three different ways that a fool is described. They're called simple, they're called a mocker, and then they're called a a fool. And so as that is the backdrop, I think we have a lot to learn about what foolishness looks like. And so I want to ask a few questions this morning. Number one, what's the definition in the Bible of a fool? What does that look like so I can know it when I see it or see it in me? Number two, what kind of fool am I? Because apparently there's different kinds of fools. I need to understand what kind am I. And then third, how can I avoid being a fool? If if I want to go in the opposite direction, what does the book of Proverbs in, in wisdom teach me about avoiding that? So I think this could be incredibly practical for, for most of us this morning. So let's start here. What's the definition of a fool? And if we just sort of took a 30,000-foot view of the book of Proverbs, this is what a fool is. A fool is someone who is out of touch with reality and should know better. Those two things sort of have to go together. It's someone who's out of touch with reality and they should know better. The should know better part is really important. Let me explain. Um, how many of you have ever heard of a Krispy Kreme donut? I love me some Krispy Kremes. They are a sign of the grace of God. Especially when the little red light is on and they're nice and, and hot. And my first memory of Krispy Kremes, I grew up for the first five years of my life, I, I lived in North Carolina, which is the home, the birthplace, as it were, uh, of Krispy Kremes. And I can remember going, when the little red light was on, and getting, you know, a box of a dozen donuts with my mom. And I, I don't know why, but at one point, and this is one of my earliest memories of Krispy Kremes, I found myself alone in the kitchen with nearly a full box of a dozen Krispy Kreme donuts. And I was usually allowed to have one or like a half, you know, something like that. And I must have been, uh, not five yet, so maybe three or four years old. And so what do you think I did? Left alone in the kitchen with the full box of Krispy Kremes. I ate the entire box. I ate all of the Krispy Kreme donuts. Do you think that was a good thing or a bad thing? Both. It was really good to begin with because they're so good. But then it was really bad, you know, later on. Now, was that foolish? No. Here's why. Here's why. I didn't know better. I, kn- I didn't know that that would. I knew that there was a reason that my mom had only given me one or a half. And, and, but I didn't know why. Then I knew <laughs> a little bit later. And so it. To know better is an important part. It, there's, there's some things that you, just, you have not experienced or, or haven't learned. That's not foolishness. Um, but if I was to eat the whole box of Krispy Kremes tonight, would that be foolish? No, that would just be good. Yeah, of course, that would be foolish. Yeah, you're right. Because why? Because I should know better. Now, what's the definition of a fool? It's being out of touch with reality, and you should know better. Now, I'm not just talking about, a, in the scripture, a foolishness is not just a particular skill, um, like you're foolish um, with uh, your bank account. or your, it, it, it's, This is talking about, in general, 
being out of touch with reality. And so uh, Tim Keller, who's a, a pastor, a teacher in New York City, summarized this, uh, I think, brilliantly. And I couldn't say it any better than he. So uh, a lot of what I'm going to teach about this one part comes right from, from Tim's book. And he said this, that, that the two basic fundamental facts that foolishness in the scriptures disregard are order and brokenness. Here's, wh- here's what he means. That, that on, on the very, very base level, the things that you're out of touch with, according to the scriptures, if you act foolishly, are number one, that there's an order to the world. That, that there are order laws that are in place that govern the way things work in our world. And that's true physically, it's true emotionally, it's true socially, it's true spiritually. That there is an order to the way things work. Maybe another way to say it is there's a cause and effect in the world that you can observe. And so think about physically. Like there, there's a physical order. You, you cannot just eat whatever you want, a dozen Krispy Kremes, and think it will, be, it will not affect you. You can't disregard health and exercise and expect that your body's going to respond positively. Why? Because someone's out to get you? No. There's an order of things. You can watch and observe a cause and effect. And it's not just physical. It's emotional. It's social. It's moral. It's spiritual. There is a cause and effect that you can observe. Now, Christians say this is because the world was designed by God. And so there are verses like, you will reap what you sow. Yeah, what's that saying? It's saying there's just, you can learn it. If you do this, this is likely to be the outcome. That, that's why Psalm 14.1 says, the fool says in his heart, there's no God. Implying there's no order. I just make up the rules. Well, that's not true. And even if you took God out of the picture, in a secular sense, there are laws of nature. You don't get to pick whether gravity is at work or not. Right? Gravity works whether you believe in it or not. The point is that there is an order to the world. And if you continually live like there's no uh, observable cause and effect, that's foolish. And you will make foolish choices. Remember in week two, if you were here, um, Kevin talked about the law of the path. And this really gets at that. The, the law of the path, Kevin said, is that your direction, not your intention, determines your destination. Right? So it doesn't matter if I intend to go to Florida and I'm on 95 North, I'm not going to end up there. As much as I intend and hope and envision myself, that your direction Why? Because that's the way the world works. That your direction determines your destination, not your intention. Right? And so, number one on the foolish hit parade is if you're out of touch with this reality, there is an order in the world. And if you act like there's not, that's foolish. But second, Keller says, you could be out of touch with reality in the opposite direction and understand, not understand, that that The order has been broken, that we live in a broken world, that one of the effects of sin entering the world, and does anybody need convincing that there's sin in the world? Yeah, just watch, you know, (laughs) and and, uh, turn on the news or turn on your computer. You you got it. One of the effects of sin being in the world is that there's a brokenness to that order. What does that mean? It means that sometimes... Bad things happen no matter how hard you try or what you do. Have you learned that? That that sometimes bad things happen, no matter and sometimes good things happen no matter how much you screw up. There's a there's a brokenness to the order in the world. And if you're not aware of that, Keller says, you will also end up making foolish choices. So to ignore either of those makes you a fool. And, and you really should know better, <laughs> right? That's the part, and you're like, well, I've, this is the first time I've heard that. Well, now you've heard it. <laughs> and so now you're accountable to that, that the idea of those realities 
um, should govern your decision making. And so he gives titles to these two types of, of being out of touch. To the person who acts like there's no order in the world, that I'm the judge and right and wrong are only my judgment and whatever's right for me is right for me, he calls a relativist. And he says, if, if that's your stance in life, there's no order, you will make foolish choices because you're a relativist. But on the other side of the coin, if you act like the order always works, then he was what you call, he calls a moralist, which your idea would be, if you live right, your life goes right. And that's not always the case, is it? And so you can be out of touch with reality in either of these two ways. Now, that's, that's the first thing. That's the definition. What's the definition of a fool? Biblically, it's being out of touch with reality in one of those two ways, and you should know better. Now, what kind are there? <laughs> There's a bunch of different kinds of expressions of that. Let's go back to uh, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 22. And, and you could see different kinds. How long will you simple love your simple ways? How long will mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? There's three different kinds of fools that the scripture talks about. Um, let's look at them together. Then you can decide what kind of fool you are. Um, number one, there's the word that's defined there, simple. And, and that might be also defined gullible or, or naive. Uh, look at Proverbs 14, 15, and 16. It talks about the, the simple here. Let me read it for you. Verses 15 and 16 says this. This kind of fool, the simple, believe anything. But the prudent give thought to their steps. The wise fear the Lord and shun evil. But a fool is hot-headed and yet feels secure. Now, so what do we learn here? That this first type of fool, called a, a simple fool, is someone who believes whoever's talking to them. <laughs> that whoever has the microphone, you're buying it. Whoever has the most likes, you're following that. Whoever is the most popular of the day, you're following that. And the scripture says that's foolish. That's a simple fool. You believe everything. Proverbs 7.22 says that those folks, the simple fools, are like an ox going to the slaughter. Like a deer stepping into a noose. What's it saying? That you're just going down this path because someone's telling you, this will be great. And you buy it. And, and that's foolish. And do you see that? And let me give you an example. Um, if you are someone who, every time someone comes up with a, the next um, make a million dollars by next week scheme, you sign up. You're like, this is going to be the one. And you tell two people, and they tell two people, and, they tell, and you're going to right, you're gonna be Mark Zuckerberg by next year. And, and uh, the scripture says, but that's foolish. You can't just buy every person that comes along. That, 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 will, that will lead to bad decisions. And some of you are thinking, yeah, I, I've got a whole catalog of those. Why? Because I just took the advice of whoever, whoever the next person was speaking into my life. I just bought it hook, line, and sinker. That's the first type of fool. But second, there's this word fool there in, in Proverbs 14. It says, then the fool, and, and that word is translated, uh, fool is stubborn or obstinate. It's almost the opposite of the simple fool. The, the, the word translated fool there is the person who you don't believe anybody. <laughs> you, you don't take advice from anybody. You always know better. And the book of Proverbs says, that's foolish. You don't always know better. And, and that will end up having bad decisions in your life. The way it's described in Proverbs 26, 11 is this. It says, like a dog returns to its vomit, so fools repeat their folly. That's graphic, isn't it? Ugh. But that's what happens when you don't listen to people at all. You always know better. Well, that's foolish. I'll give you an example. Somebody is, is saying to you, look, if you continue to neglect your marriage, 
because you just are working uh, all the time, that's going to end up bad for you. And you're like, well, you don't know. I provide. I have to do that to provide. And somebody else says, you know, I think I see this growing gap in your relationship. And you're like, you don't know what you're talking about. You always know better. The scripture says, that's foolish. And it'll end up causing you to make foolish decisions. Ones that you wish you could take back. So the first type of fool is a simple fool. They believe everything. The second type of fool is the stubborn or the obstinate fool. You don't believe anybody. And the third type, I don't know if you, you saw it here, was a mocker. And if we look at Proverbs 14 a little bit earlier, verses 6 to 9, we read about this, this mocker. If I could find the right page. Here we go. 6 to 9. It says, the mocker seeks wisdom and finds none. <laughs> but knowledge comes easily to the discerning. So discerning and mocker are, are ant- antithesis statements there. Stay away from a fool, for, if you, for you will not find knowledge on their lips. The wisdom of the prudent is to give thought to their ways, but the folly of fools is deception. Last verse. Fools mock at making amends for sin, but goodwill is found among the upright. So it's this third type of fool that the Bible presents is a mocker. It could also, sometimes it's translated scoffer. It it could be arrogant or or domineering. And and these people are too busy putting other people down to even hear input from anybody else. They're always the one giving the advice, always in every situation. They want to tell you how to live your life, do your job, raise your kids, right? They, They always are the ones who are, are, and if you would ever happen to get a word in to them um, that was slightly critical, they would have a comeback that would crush you. You know these people? And it's a zinger. And you're like, how do they do that? And so you don't give them any advice, right? And so this mocker type of a fool, um, the scripture says it this way, Proverbs 21, 24. It says, and proud and arrogant person Mocker is his name, behaves with insolent fury. Now, I didn't know what insolent meant, so I had to look it up. And it means rude and arrogant. And that's why if you turn the page to the next proverb, it says this about getting rid of those people in your group. In Proverbs 22, verse 10, it says, Drive out the mocker, and out goes strife and quarrels and insults are ended. Do you think you know somebody like this? Yeah, you do. And you know why you do? Because that's probably not your kind of foolishness. <laughs> because here's the thing. We just went through all three kinds. Most of the time, when I started the message and I said people who are foolish, you thought of the other kind, not your kind. It's so, right? Because it's so easy to see in other people. You're like, how? why do they do that? Why could they be so foolish? And, and we're sort of blind to our own. So, which kind are you? Let me give you a little diagnostic test. And, and you can use this on yourself. You don't have to share it with anybody this morning. Here's a great diagnostic. To know what kind of fool you tend to lean towards, ask yourself this question. How do I deal with criticism? When somebody criticizes me, what typically happens inside of me? Well, if you're a simple fool, the naive, gullible one, It crushes you. When people are critical, it just crushes you. Why? Because you just assume they're right. (laughs) And and you you don't take into context their perspective, their experience, their motive, none of that. You just go, oh, they must be right. And it crushes you when someone criticizes you. This is an example would be um, somebody says, you know, you're a bad mom because you serve And you go volunteer, and you leave your kids, that's being a bad mom. And you're like, oh, I must be so bad. And and that's foolish. You might make dumb decisions based on that information that's completely a fallacy. If if you are crushed by, uh, by people's criticism, this might be you. Secondly, um, 
If you're a stubborn, obstinate fool, you respond to criticism, and it goes in one ear and out the other. <laughs> you're like, it doesn't even phase you. You're just like, mm, what was that? Right? <laughs> Why? Because you, everyone's wrong. <laughs> you're always right. And so it doesn't even phase you. Uh, and this would be uh, someone who says, uh, you know, I think that you're driving a, a wedge between you and your kid because you're so strict. Um, I think that it's not having the effect that maybe you think it's having. And you're like, you're silly. You know? Somebody else says the same thing. You know, I, I see this uh, relationship and it's starting to unravel. And I don't think you see it. Uh, you don't know what you're talking about. If it just goes in one ear and out the other, well, that might be a sign that you're this second kind of fool. And third, if, if you're the mocker, scoffer type of fool, probably no one ever criticizes you because <laughs> they're afraid <laughs> of what the comeback is going to be, and you're too busy criticizing them for them ever to criticize you. Is that you? So you think you do most things right because nobody ever corrects you. That might be a sign that you're this type of fool. Um, which kind are you? So, so how many of you go like, I got the trifecta. <laughs> I think, like, depending on which sex, you know, people I'm with, I could be all kinds of fools. Well, me too. But it's helpful to see it, isn't it? And they go, oh, yeah. Sometimes I do act like that. Oh, yeah. That probably isn't the best. I see that in me. So let's go to the last piece. How do you stop that? How do you avoid being foolish? And just one more scripture. This is from the Apostle Paul in... Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, he's writing to a church in Corinth, new church, and they're just trying to figure out how to live out their faith. And 1 Corinthians 3.18 says this, Do not deceive yourselves. If any of you think you are wise by the standards of this age, you should, get this, become fools so that you may become wise. It goes on to say that the wisdom of God is the opposite of the wisdom of the world. That it's wiser than the foolishness of this age. And so it teaches us two things about how to move in the direction away from being a fool. Number one, it says, the most foolish thing you could do is to say, I'm not a fool. <laughs> right? It says, if you say... I've, I never, ever do any of that. That's a really good sign that you're doing a lot of it. So number one, you have to embrace the idea that becoming a fool, becoming wise starts with understanding I'm not there yet. Right? But then second, it says become a fool. What kind of fool? If you would turn the page, he expounds on this idea. And the Apostle Paul says, become a fool for Christ. And and this is a very particular type of foolishness. It looks foolish on the outside, but it's completely congruent with the ultimate reality of the world. See? And what's, uh, what's the greatest example of the foolishness of God? It's the cross. Right? The world looked on and saw what? Defeat. Um, weakness. And what was actually going on, the reality of the situation, was it was the greatest victory in the history of time. It was the greatest strength demonstrated of any person that's ever walked the planet. You see, if, if you begin to be a fool like Christ, it will look foolish to some, but it will be the wisest thing you could ever do. And think about how the cross is so in touch with ultimate reality. Remember we started with a fool is out of touch with reality in two different ways? There's an order to things. The cross says absolutely there is. There is right and wrong. And you can't avoid that. And there's a brokenness to that reality, to that order, right? Yeah, the cross says it's so broken that Jesus had to die in order to, to address the brokenness in the world. That's dire but then the cross says one more thing. It says that there's not just an order to things. There's not just a brokenness to things. There's also a redemption to things. That because Jesus 
is broken, you and I can be whole. And, and that's really wise. And, and so anybody here need some wisdom? Yeah. Look at the cross. See yourself through that lens of reality. See yourself and the decisions that you're making this week through the lens of that reality. Become a fool for Christ, and you'll move towards wisdom. Now, look, I, I don't know any better way to end this service after I just told you to look at the cross than invite you to be up close and personal with the work of Christ on the cross. So here at the end, we're going to come to the Lord's table. We're going to receive communion together. And what communion is, is becoming as close as possible to the centrality of the cross. It actually becomes part of you. And, and that will be a step towards wisdom. So I'm going to invite the band to come back up. And I'm going to ask that you join me in prayer as we prepare our hearts to do just that. Let's do it. Gosh, Father, um, how foolish I can be sometimes. And thank you for giving me a picture, giving me a mirror where I can see how the dumb decisions get started. And, and I, I want to move in the other direction. And I want us all to take steps towards being wise. So help us to see the cross now. Help us to see the death and resurrection of our Savior that looked like foolishness, but was oh so wise. Help that become part of me and how I see myself and how I see the world. I pray it 